First half of this video, I answer yet another argument I've been hearing from my King James only brothers on what computer scientists call the internet. Second half of this video, I talk super quickly, like more quickly than you can imagine, so you won't get bored, you might even be mildly amused, through 10 of the easiest false friends in the King James Version. False friends that most experienced King James readers already know. Do you? You'll find out. Then I've got a special announcement at the end of the video. Make sure to hang on for that. Here's the argument that I've been hearing. It sounds initially plausible and therefore deserves attention on this channel. It goes like this. How dare anyone say that any word in the King James Version is dead? No, the word of God is quick and powerful. It's living. The King James Version is read every day by countless people. Its words are not dead. They're still in use all over the world. I think there are some easy replies to this argument. First, the vast majority of King James English is living English. I've never said that it's not. I've never claimed that the entire King James Version is unreadable or unintelligible. I said the opposite consistently and repeatedly. Most of it is intelligible to today's average person. But the mere existence of multiple separate resources made by King James only people for King James only people that list hundreds of archaic and obsolete words in the King James has to mean something too. If every single word in the King James Version is living, why did the King James only Trinitarian Bible Society produce a 779 word list of archaic and obsolete words? Why did David Daniels produce a King James Bible companion booklet for people to slip inside their Bibles containing 500 plus archaic and obsolete words? Why do I have a 450 page King James Bible word book explaining those same words in detail? Maybe yes, these particular King James words are living, but only in the sense that a person who's gone into cardiac arrest is living during those seconds when the electric paddles are jump-starting his heart. Here's the less graphic and more patient reply to that argument. There are two kinds of uses of language, at least. There's receiving and there's producing. In other words, there's reading and listening on the one hand, and there's speaking and writing on the other. Shakespeare's words are read and heard every day all over the English-speaking world, but even some of the most famous words in all his canon Wherefore art thou Romeo are still commonly misunderstood. It means something like, why are you Romeo? Or why do you have to be called Romeo? In other words, he's part of this other family and it'd be so convenient if he weren't in that family. Why don't people understand Shakespeare better? His words get received, but they never get produced, except from a script. No one ever uses them in that way in real life outside of the study and performance of Shakespeare. Your brain will immediately tell you which words in these following Shakespearean sentences are dead. The soldiers were arrayed in all accomplements. Great lords, from Ireland am I come amain. He's a coward and a coistrel that will not drink to my niece. You know what else is used every day? The Latin Vulgate Bible the most influential Bible translation in the history of the Western world, by far. I actually personally listen to some of the Vulgate's words frequently because I love classical Western sacred choral music above all other musical traditions. And the standard Requiem includes texts with wording precisely the same as the Latin Vulgate. I've heard these words from the Bible set by all kinds of composers. I also took Latin in 8th grade in 1994. I happened to get a perfect score on the final, as I recall, and I've listened to beautiful Latin texts from the Bible for 20 plus years, and uh, I don't actually understand them all. They're received, they're read and heard by me, but they're never produced. I never say them or write them. These Latin words from all of these beautiful songs are not as dead as Proto-Indo-European, a language which almost certainly existed but left no written record, but the fact that people's eyes and ears encounter these words doesn't mean they produce understanding. It doesn't mean they're really alive. This is kind of why we had to have a Protestant Reformation. We had to put the Bible and the whole church service into the language of the people. Because, 1 Corinthians 14 teaches, edification requires intelligibility. When my King James only brothers say, how dare anyone say that any word in the King James Version is dead? No, it's living. They're citing Hebrews 4.12. Let me read that whole verse to you. Vivus est enim sermo dei, et efficax et penetrabilior omni gladio ansipiti, et pertinhens usque ad divisionem animae ac spiritus, compagum coque ac medularum, et descritor cagi cagitationum et intentionum cordis. I just read the verse to you in poorly pronounced Latin. Let me ask you, was the word of God living in those words? Yes, but not for you and me. Yes for Latin speakers, no for everyone else. 
Now, I'm a word nerd, so I got a fair number of the individual words. I got vivus and est, that's living and is. I saw the word and, which in Latin is et. I saw the word god, I saw the word all, the word division, the word spirit. I saw the word also, and thinking, and intent, and heart. I got a lot of the words. So, was this the living word of God for me? No. It was a series of unconnected ideas. As best I can tell, this is an accurate translation, but it's not living and powerful. Every time there's a word or a construction I don't understand, the power is instantly and completely gone. The words of the Bible are not magic. God's words are powerful only for those who understand them. Okay, second half of the video. Easy false friends. Many people know these, but they're still dead because no one uses them. No one speaks or writes them, not even in sermons, except when directly quoting the King James Version. I'm not going to go through all five of my steps with each of these words since they are often, but not always known by readers who have some experience reading the King James Version. Here's false friend number 24 in my overall YouTube list. It's the simple word, want. Now who doesn't know Psalm 23, 1? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But want here is a false friend, though again an easy one. The Hebrew word means to lack, and that's precisely what one sense of want used to be, to be lacking. The Oxford English Dictionary marks this sense as obsolete. No one produces this use of the word anymore, this sense of want, even if many people have learned to receive it because it is a common, easy false friend in the King James Version. False friend 25 is prevent. We which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That's 1 Thessalonians 4.15 in the King James. When he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon? That's Matthew 17.25. Today, prevent, in context like these two I've just read, most naturally means stops or hinders. In 1611, prevent had an intransitive sense that the Oxford English Dictionary marks as obsolete. It is an etymological sense that anyone who knows his Latin will see in a second because pre means before and vent means come. So prevent used to be able to mean come before or go before, which is just what the Greek words in these two verses I've mentioned mean. In other words, we who are alive will not go before those who are asleep. And Jesus spoke to him first. He went first. This is what modern translations consistently say. Prevent is a false friend, though one many people know. False friend 26 on my list of easy false friends is let in 2 Thessalonians 2.7 and a couple other passages. Most King James readers with some experience know this one. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The Greek word here means prevent or hinder or restrain. But today, to let someone do something is to permit them to do it, not to prevent them from doing it, to hinder them. But the Oxford English Dictionary has a sense of let that means something similar to what the Greek word does, and sure enough, the OED marks this sense as obsolete. We end up with a special kind of false friend, a word that now means the very opposite of what it once did. Instead of prevent, it now means Permit. False friend 27 is another easy one. Conversation. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. 1 Timothy 4.12, King James Version. A good reader will notice that in word and in conversation seem to be redundant. What else do you have conversations with except with words? But not every one of the 20 places where the King James uses this particular false friend, conversation, provides contextual clues that the word meant something different in 1611. Like Psalm 50, 23, and here's Philippians 1, 27. Let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. To my English-speaking mind, that means talk with others in a way that fits Christ's gospel. And literally moments before I hit record on my camera to make this video, a Bible teacher friend of mine at my beloved alma mater sent me evidence that one of his college students had been tripped up by this very false friend. The Greek word here doesn't mean to talk or converse or communicate. It means to live or to conduct yourself. And sure enough, there's a sense of 
conversation in the OED that matches the Greek very well. Here it is. The action of living or having one's being in a place or among persons. There's another sense that OED marks as archaic that is very similar. Here it is. Manner of conducting oneself in the world or in society, behavior, mode, or course of life. The OED shows that both the obsolete and the archaic senses of conversation appear in the King James Bible. But I've never heard anyone produce the word conversation in either sense. Even though many people who've been around the King James block a few times know this word, it is, for many people, a false friend. I already did meat and cattle in another video. Those aren't super hard false friends, though they do trip some people up and tripped me up, especially as a kid. Here's another food-related false friend, number 28, corn. This one isn't hard either, but it definitely tripped me up when I was an exclusive reader of the King James Version. I specifically recall reading the story of Joseph and picturing in my head ears of corn when he interprets that famous dream. The same usage is picked up in the New Testament. Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, Acts 7.12. The Greek word here means food or grain, and sure enough, there's a sense of corn in the OED that matches the Greek word perfectly. The OED explains that Corn is still used as a collective singular for the fruit of the cereals, that is the edible seeds of many grains, including wheat, rye, barley, oats, maize, rice, etc. But it says that in the US, corn refers specifically to Indian corn, what we know of as corn on the cob. This then, according to the OED, is a false friend in the US and not in Britain. Though I'd love to hear from British viewers if corn is still understood generically and not specifically there. Does the OED need to be updated at this word? Let me know in the comments, Brits. False friend number 29 is the phrase fetched a compass. And from thence we fetched a compass and came to Regium, Acts 28, 13. It was part of KJV reader lore when I was KJV only personally to recognize that fetched a compass didn't mean went and grabbed a magnetic device for telling where true north lies. It meant went around or went in a circuit. The Greek word here is actually pretty difficult. We're not totally sure what it meant in this context because the word means just removed. But the text doesn't say what was removed. Most major translations stick with the King James interpretation here, though the best Greek-English lexicon says it's more probable that the word was sort of shorthand for saying that they removed the anchor or the ropes. In other words, they set sail. They're using a part for the whole. The part is removing those ropes, the whole is setting sail. And that's just what the CSB says. In any case, nobody says fetched a compass to mean made a circuit anymore. Do I really have to look this one up in the OED? Okay, I will. The OED doesn't actually say that this phrase is obsolete. It's labeled as archaic. But have you ever heard anyone produce this word compass to mean anything other than this device in my hand? False friend number 30 is fair. Now this one is really easy because the relevant sense of this word is definitely not obsolete. It's only archaic as contemporary dictionaries show. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months, Acts 7.20. Now, fair can still be a false friend in some places for some people because we don't produce this use of the word very often. It's archaic. People don't usually say this anymore, but it's among those words that because of BBC historical dramas and because of obvious context in the King James, like thou art fair, my love, many people do know. Fair meant beautiful. Not that Moses was exceedingly average or exceedingly just. There are one or two places in the King James where I think there isn't quite enough context to make certain that today's readers will catch this minor false friend. Ezekiel 31 7 is one. Thus was he fair in his greatness in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. I could see people mistaking fair to mean just there. Of course, the Hebrew and Greek words that are translated fair in the King James didn't sound archaic to their original hearers like fair does to us. Beautiful would eliminate confusion and sound like contemporary speech instead of sounding archaic. False friend number 31 is peculiar. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation a peculiar people, 1 Peter 2, 9. This one is not as easy as fair. I think many experienced King James readers do know that it doesn't mean strange. That doesn't fit very well in the context. My guess is that they don't actually know, however, what the King James translators did mean by that word. And that's because it is a false friend. The relevant sense doesn't exist in our English anymore. No one produces it. A person's private property is the sense, which is just the same as the sense of the Greek word here. We Christians as a people are, like the Jews, God's private property. It's a beautiful and powerful image. Contemporary translations say, a people for his own possession, but the relevant sense of peculiar is clearly marked as obsolete in the OED. This is a false friend. Although we all know some peculiar Christians, this verse is not saying we're all strange. False friend number 32 is 
quick. This word shows up in multiple contexts in which good readers will realize that our modern sense of moving quickly with speed doesn't work well. I personally have witnessed, however, King James-only pastors who have been tripped up by this false friend. Just off the top of the verses hidden in my heart, I can think of Ephesians 2.1 in the King James, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. I can think of the phrase naming people God will judge, namely the quick and the dead in 2 Timothy 4.1. And I can think of Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick and powerful. These verses aren't talking about people or the word moving with speed. To be quick once meant to be alive. To quicken meant to make alive. The OED entry for quick is actually really interesting because there are almost 20 senses related to life, all of which are pretty well obsolete, or at least rare or poetic. But this is definitely for many readers in certain places in the New Testament, especially Hebrews 4.12, a false friend. Number 33, our 10th and final false friend for this video, but the 33rd on my YouTube channel overall, is study in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This one is greatly ironic, because this is probably the one false friend that I have most frequently heard trip up King James-only pastors and other King James-only brothers. It's a near-perfect false friend, because the context fits our modern sense of the word study perfectly. That modern sense is this, to apply the mental faculties to the acquisition of knowledge. That's what the King James Version appears to be saying here. If you want to be an approved workman, rightly dividing the word of truth, that is, rightly interpreting the Bible, you're going to have to hit the books. You are going to have to study hard. But that's not what the Greek word here means. It means to be especially conscientious in discharging an obligation. Take pains, make every effort, be zealous, be diligent, do your best to show yourself to be approved before God. That diligent, zealous taking of pains will certainly include hitting the books, but the word in 1611, the word study, was much broader than that. It meant to aim, endeavor, or undertake deliberately to do something, according to the OED, which marks this sense as rare. We have another false friend, though one that many King James readers now do know. That's my list of easy false friends, 10 of them, though I'm sure I missed some. Please let me know in the comments if you think I did, and you might make it into a future video. Many well-educated readers will know the easy false friends I've listed here, or they'll figure out their meaning from context. But not everyone who needs to read the Bible is well-educated or a skilled reader. Some people are going to get tripped up by these false friends. That's what makes them false friends. And it's all so avoidable. We have commonly known equivalents for every single one of these words. We've got lack, we've got come before, we've got prevent, conduct, grain, circled, beautiful, personal possession, alive, be diligent. People often say that modern English is degraded compared to Elizabethan English. Do those words sound degraded to you? Is alive degraded? It's in the King James. Would it be so bad if we removed these wholly unnecessary barriers to understanding? Barriers that don't trip up everyone, but do trip up some? A pastor friend of mine just sent me a King James quiz he gave to his congregation in a church whose ministry has been King James only for many, many decades. I wasn't surprised by all the results. They are, frankly, what I predicted. And I hope to release some more details about this quiz in time. But I was shocked and disturbed by the results on one false friend in particular. Now, these people who took the quiz are standard American conservative Christians. A full half of them put down the wrong answer for the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This precious phrase is supposed to be for the plowboy, for the shepherd boy, not just the college graduate. And they misunderstood it. Eight of the 18 people who took this quiz thought it meant desire. One thought it meant request. Only half of them, nine of them, understood that it meant lack. These Christians also got tripped up big time by prevent, he that now letteth will let, and fetched a compass. Now, I don't have lots more scientifically gathered evidence than this little quiz right here, and I will be the first to admit it. Perhaps this church is an outlier. Perhaps the people are particularly poor readers, though I don't think so. And perhaps the pastor is a poor teacher, though I happen to know that this is not the case. I listened to his message. But the only way to show that the false friends I've been pointing out actually do trip up a significant percentage of King James readers is to use these tools of empirical science like this quiz does. We need a formal study of the readability of King James Version English. And here's my announcement. 
I am now working with a Doctor of Ministry student at a conservative seminary here in the United States on getting more data like this quiz in as rigorous and scientific a way as possible. We want help from King James Only Brothers. We want you to believe that the test we come up with is fair and that the results are reliable. We want you to have a voice in the creation of the quiz. And if, as nearly all my King James Only Brothers, except two I can think of, have repeatedly insisted to me, my false friend's idea is wholly illegitimate and the King James Version is on a fifth grade reading level, then this study will vindicate you. I promise that I will release the results of this study, which may take more than a year, no matter whether they appear to favor my viewpoint or not. I am working very hard with a statistics expert friend of mine and others to help make sure this test is fair and accurate. We hope to track even whether long exposure to the King James Version helps readers understand it better. That's what defenders of the King James always tell me. Any pastors who are interested in participating, please contact me through the contact form on my my website, which is byfaithweunderstand.com, and I'll have the link down in the show notes. I'm beginning to collect names to help this demon student I'm advising. We need you, pastors. We need you. I'm super excited about this. My ideas about dead words and false friends will, I pray, get their day in the only court that really matters, the experience of actual Bible readers.